What's up everyone, Lion Roar here, and this is episode 7 of the Beginner's Guide to Gods Unchained, and in this one, I'm going to share all the secrets to building a quality deck so that you can win more games. But first, join me over in Gemstone Legends. It's a fantastic match 3 RPG game, and it's players that get in early on games like this that are at the biggest advantage. Not only will you help the channel out by using the link in the description of this video, but you're going to get a free epic hero named Moralia along with a bunch of gold, gems, and potions. After you download the game, you'll have access to events which will get you even more amazing heroes and loot. Guys, wow. You don't want to miss this opportunity because you do not get it in the regular app store. Download it now, and I will see you in Gemstone Legends. All right, so the secret to building a quality deck actually comes down to two things. First, finding cards that have synergy, and second, choosing cards that follow a nice mana curve. Let's break this down. So when I say synergy, I mean that you're maximizing the amount of cards in your deck that work together well. I'm going to give you an example of just two cards, but you want to try to make as many cards as possible work together well. So here we have Valkus Captain, which is a two mana Viking, and we have Battle Bard, which is a one mana two one Viking as well, but its text says, Roar, give a friendly Viking plus two strength. So because they're both Vikings, when Battle Bard comes into play, it's going to make Valkus Captain stronger. Instead of being a two mana three two, now Valkus Captain is a two mana five two, and that makes it really aggressive. There's even some hidden synergy here as well. If you look at the text of Valka's Captain, uh, which says, if you're frenzied, give that relic plus one strength because um, when it comes onto the board, it's creating this one, one barbed hook relic. And if you have other aggressive creatures in your deck, like Battle Bard, like let's say you already played Battle Bard and gave another Viking plus two strength, and then you played Valka's Captain after that. Well, if that other creature had already done damage, then it's it's making your god frenzied and that gives the relic that Valka's captain creates plus one strength. You can see now that the cards are working together to create more strength for both the relics and the creatures in the deck, which means that it's a more aggressive deck than if you were to just play, let's say, Battle Bard in some random deck with no other Vikings. The next thing we need to talk about is Mana Curve. Because it's great if you find a lot of cards with synergy, but you do have to play them. So if you just choose uh, cards for your deck that cost 5 mana, 6 mana, and 7 mana because they all look really powerful, you're never going to be able to play anything on turn 1, 2, or 3. You know, maybe on turn 4 with the way that they give you mana gems to be able to ramp. But you can't just not play anything for the first few turns of the game. It's great that all the higher mana costing cards are extremely powerful, but you actually have to make it to the late game to be able to play those. So what I've shown on the screen here is a really standard mana curve, and it's showing at the bottom here in blue what the mana cost of the cards are, and at the top how many of those cards are in the deck. So in this deck, there would be four one-costing cards. There would be five two-costing cards, six three-cost cards, six four cost cards and so on and so on. The reason it's called a curve is because you can see the shape of it curves like this. Now for newer players, you want to probably have a curve like this because uh, you're going to have the most natural style of gameplay. You're always or mostly going to always have something that you can play at any point of the game, beginning, middle or end, that's pretty powerful. Now notice in the middle, uh, most of the cards in this deck cost 3 and 4 mana, but there's some that cost 1 and 2, and there's some that cost 5 or 6. Typically, the 5 and 6 mana costing cards are the most powerful in the game, um, and the 1 and 2 mana costing cards are maybe not as powerful, uh, but you play them earliest so they have a bigger impact on the game. You need to use the 1 and 2 mana costing cards to make it to the mid game, and then those cards to make it to the late game. But there are different deck types and strategies in Gods Unchained and other trading card games for that matter. So a lot of this is going to overlap if you've played games like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, or things like that. 
So there are four main deck types in Gods Unchained, uh, and the first three are really a game of rock, paper, and scissors, and that's aggro, mid-range, and control. Now, these deck types can exist with any of the gods that are out there, but aggro decks tend to be really fast and try to deal a lot of damage before the opponent can do anything about it. Mid-range decks are a lot slower, but have a lot more powerful creatures in them. Uh, the mana curve for a mid-range deck actually looks a lot like the mana curve I just showed you with a lot of like three, four, maybe five um, mana cost things in the deck. Uh, and then control decks tend to try to kill all the creatures that they possibly can, draw cards, gain advantage through perhaps two for wanting their opponent. Like for example, dealing with two of the opponent's cards for only one card that the control player is using so that they can take control of the board, keep their opponent from playing and ultimately win through uh, putting down a really powerful card or creature. Now, the reason that this is rock, paper, and scissors is because aggro tends to beat control decks, control decks tend to beat mid-range decks, and mid-range decks tend to beat aggro decks. So when you're choosing one of these styles, you're typically choosing to play rock, paper, and scissors with the uh, opponents in the metagame. Now, when I say metagame, I mean the sum of all the decks that people tend to be playing. And almost all the decks fall into one of these three categories. So when you make your decision, you know you're going to have certain strengths and weaknesses. This is actually a sign of a healthy metagame when you have rock, paper, and scissors because it means there's not one deck that's dominating everything. That would be unhealthy. Um, if you have decks out there that tend to beat other decks and there's always a way uh, to find a deck that beats another deck, then you know you're in the healthy metagame. However, there is a fourth deck type, and it tends to beat all of these, but these can also beat it, and that is combo. And the reason that's the case is because combo decks are trying to find a couple of very specific cards to play at the same time, and when they do, it tends to be so powerful the opponent can't do anything about it. Uh, there are even potentially infinite combos that can happen where once the combo is assembled, the opponent really can't do anything about it. Um, this would actually be a sign of an unhealthy metagame in Gods Unchained because nobody wants to see a deck that just wins when somebody has the couple of cards that they need. So combo decks can exist, but the aggro midrange and control decks need to be able to have a way to win against them. So Gods Unchained will need to be careful not to print cards that are going to be powerful combos that can't be dealt with. Let's take a deeper look at the different deck types. And first is aggro. And you can see for this one, the mana curve on it is a lot different than what we just looked at uh, for a normal mana curve. And that's because there are a whole lot of one mana and two mana cards in the deck. That's going to be uh, primarily what the deck is centered around. And you're going to do most of the damage with these particular cards. And then you have three, four, and five mana cards to come in and finish the game. So some examples of cards that go well in an aggro deck are, first of all, of course, your one mana cards, where the strength is higher than the mana cost. That's key in building a good aggressive deck. So this Wiccan Warrior has two strength, which is higher than the one mana cost. It's also hidden for one turn, and evasion like this is really good at helping you sneak some damage in and making sure that it actually lands. Then we have uh, the Black Jaguar here, which of course has three strength for two mana. And I wanted to give you an example of a higher costing card that helps you go over the top and do that last little bit of damage. It might seem like Sing Song Seder, uh, which I'm showing here goes against everything I just said because it's a four mana, two strength creature. However, take a look at the text. Roar, give each other friendly creature plus one strength. So really when it comes out in a deck like this, hopefully you already have three, four, five creatures already on the board. Well, really this is potentially adding maybe six or seven points of damage to the board. And typically when something like this comes out, it ends the game for the aggro player. Next, let's take a look at mid-range, and you're going, you're going to see that the uh, curve on this one looks a lot like what we had just talked about at the beginning, and that's because most of the cards in the deck are going to cost 3, 4, and maybe 5 mana, 
with some one and two mana cards that come out early to sort of control the board a little bit and then the higher costing cards to finish the game. So examples of cards in this deck are like Bronze Gate, which are more defensive. You can see for three mana, you get a two, three that says frontline can't attack and armor one. You would never put a card like this in an aggressive deck because it can't attack, it can't deal damage. But you would put it in a mid-range deck because it's coming out to soak up all the creatures that the aggressive player is putting out. Remember when I said that mid-range tends to be aggressive decks? This is why. It's really hard for an aggressive player to deal with something like the Bronze Gate because if you have one mana, two twos, like the Wicked Warrior, and it tries to attack this thing, it's not going to be able to kill it. You're going to lose it. And then that means the aggressive player has to then play another card to try and take this out and uh, is going to have difficulty with it. Another example is just these really big creatures that come out on like turn four and five. Uh, so Moon Craze Cyclops uh, comes out as a 4-4 four, four for four mana, but can grow to a 5-5 five, five, or a 6-6 six, six, or a 7-7. Seven, seven. And, you know, by then that's going to end the game, of course. And then on the higher costing side, you can see we have another really just big, tough creature, the Guild Enforcer, which is a 5 mana, 3-5 with Frontline and Armor 1. Now the control decks uh, get a little more interesting. Take a look at this curve. This mana curve is like the opposite of what you see for like a regular mana curve, especially it's like the opposite of <laughs> mid-range for sure. Um, but remember, I said the control decks tend to beat the mid-range decks. And there's a reason for that, because a lot of these lower costing cards, and there's a lot of them in a control deck, typically uh, one and two mana, tend to be there to try and deal with an opponent's creatures. Uh, they're typically one and two mana costing things that deal damage or they're creatures that you can put out that can hopefully one for one or even ideally two for one the opponent. So uh, an example, this might be like a creature like Vanguard Axewoman, who's a one mana two two, who when you put it on the board has blitz. A control player might have that in their deck just to take out the small aggressive creatures that their opponent has. Uh, but what a control player is going to do is use these cheaper cards to gain control of the board, try and deal with their opponent, and then they have these higher costing things over here because they're extremely powerful spells and creatures that ag uh, aggressive or aggro players and mid-range players are just not going to be able to deal with once they come out. Um, they might even have a top-end uh, creature that's even harder to deal with than the mid-range player. So uh, examples of cards that you're going to see in control decks are like Blight Bomb, which is a one mana uh, spell that says destroy a creature with health three or less. Um, you might have a two mana one one here, Burrowing Scar Scarab, which says afterlife, both players draw two cards. You're going to see a lot of uh, what tend to be card advantage cards in, in, a, in a control deck. Now, I think, that, um, I think that Gods Unchained has been really careful about just putting too many of these uh, card draw cards out there without giving the opponent some advantage as well. So as of right now in the meta game, you're going to see the control player have these uh, cards where both players draw a card, which typically isn't great. You want to see the control player just drawing their own cards. Um, and there are some cards out there like that, but oftentimes they're playing these because it doesn't matter how many cards their opponent draws. Uh, the control player is going to have cards that deal with multiple cards at the same time. That's called two for one. So like if the control player can play one card that destroys two of their opponent's cards or three or four or more, that's what they're going for. And we see that with the seven mana apocalypse now. Destroy all creatures and then destroy all creatures again. So for example, when the control player plays this, let's say the aggressive or the uh, uh, mid-range player played all their creatures out on the board. They have six creatures out. You know, they are going for the win, but then the control player plays this. Now, all of a sudden, one card that the control player played has dealt with all the cards that the opponent played. And that is what two for one, three for one, four for one means. Um, and what's even more special about this particular spell is that sometimes creatures leave behind other creatures. Like it'll, some creature might say, uh, afterlife, um, put a one, one creature on the board, right? Well, that's why this one's, uh, destroying all creatures again. And then lastly, you usually have the win condition, which is the, 
card that the control player plays that is almost impossible for the opponent to deal with. So for example, this nine mana, six, 12 polyhymnia, etheric hydra, <laughs> which has frontline protected ward and armor four, which is absolutely ridiculous. It's super hard to get rid of this thing. When it's out there, the control player is probably going to win. And let's talk about the combo deck. You're, you're going to see funky mana curves with this one because there are very specific cards that a combo player is going to be looking to put together. So uh, they don't necessarily have a nice curve. They just have the cards that are necessary to win. But what they do try to do is stack up on the uh, one and two mana cards uh, like an aggressive or even control player might do because they just need to kind of control things and stall the board until they're able to draw the couple of cards that they need to go off and win the game. Hopefully we don't see too many infinite combos in Gods Unchained, but there is one combo in particular I'll give you an example of that exists already, and that is uh, Shackled Acolyte, Changing Locks, and Ring of the Siren. So what a uh, combo player is going to try to do with these three cards, and they need to have these three cards. They have to draw them at some point in the game or the combo doesn't really work right? They need to draw the Shackled Acolyte and then play it for two mana. It says order three. When this creature loses order, give it plus two, plus two. Uh, when they play Changing Locks, that's a spell that says if target creature has order, remove it. Otherwise, give it order plus three. So now you're applying this to the Shackled Acolyte and uh, growing it to be uh, relatively big. Finally, uh, you have this three mana ring of the siren, which is a relic that has an ability. So when you play the ability, give a creature order plus one and give minus one durability to this relic. So you want to play the acolyte, then play changing locks, and then use the ring of the siren ability. And what you do is you create a gigantic shackled acolyte. That's going to turn this two, two shackled acolyte into an eight, seven creature, eight strength and seven health. And then next turn, you can use the ring again, and it becomes a 16-12 creature. And on the next turn, it can become a 32-22 creature. So as you can tell, combos are very, very powerful when you put the cards together. It's the ultimate synergy type of deck. Uh, the cards that not only make each other better, but are necessary to create almost an unwinnable condition for your opponent. However... Uh, luckily with this particular combo, there are ways to deal with the giant creature still. So I wouldn't say that this one's overbearing or anything, but this is a combo that exists in God's Unchained. Now, let's say that you want to start brewing some decks and you want to share them with other people, um, or you're just kind of scouring the interwebs for a deck that you want to play. There does tend to be a naming convention with these. So name your decks like this, or as you're reading the decks, uh, use this to kind of decipher what it is that you might be playing. So the naming convention is typically you call the deck uh, by its synergy plus the god and then usually the deck type. Sometimes people leave the deck type off, but I like to include it because it makes it more specific. So for example, you'll have uh, a deck out there called Zoo Light Midrange. Zoo is the synergy. Really, the synergy is just lots of uh, powerful creatures. Light is the god, and midrange is the type of deck. You also might have Frenzied War Aggro. Uh, frenzied is the synergy. Uh, usually it's a lot of little creatures that come out, and they're almost always dealing damage to the opposing god. So that means that any cards in the deck that have a frenzied ability are active. And since that's happening a lot, they're almost always active. So this is an aggressive deck with a lower ma mana curve that's trying to deal a lot of damage really fast. Then there's also Board Wipe Death Control. Board Wipe is the synergy. Uh, I give you an example of that in the control deck, the Apocalypse Now card that just destroys everything, okay? So this deck's going to have a number of ways to destroy everything on the opponent's board in order to be able to control them. It is a, a death deck, so a lot of the cards exist with the goddess of death, which is why it's called Board Wipe Death Control. And lastly, um, if you want to share the deck or you want to copy a deck, uh, there are deck codes in Gods Unchained that you can easily copy. Let's say you built the deck in uh, Immutable X in, in Gods Unchained. 
you can copy the deck code and send it to somebody else. Or if they have their deck code, you can import that and be able to uh, use the same kind of deck. Let me show you. This Nature Regen deck is a deck that I built that I've been having a lot of fun with and it's been doing really well. So I did uh, choose to share this on gudex.com. And so to do that, I clicked share deck and then I copied the code right here. And then I provided that to other people to use if they want to. And if you yourself want to uh, potentially use a deck code uh, that you got from someone else, you just click import deck at the top of the screen and then you paste it here and you'll be able to import that deck. All right, hopefully this was helpful to you to give you some ideas about how to build quality decks um, and hopefully it'll make your win percentage go up as well. Now, I wanna know in the comments, what cool decks are you putting together? Please share your deck codes in the comments because I wanna see them. I'm really curious. It always gives me really good ideas too. Uh, and I certainly will be putting out decks that I tend to brew. Uh, if you haven't already, please consider liking the video, subscribing and hitting that bell notification so you know when I drop new videos or go live and I will catch you in the next one. Thank you.